this thing that YouTube did. They forced me into a new live streaming gig and I can't make it schedule ahead of time. It used to be my thumbnail of the stream would just sit there on my channel and I could just go away and dream and people would find People would find it ahead of time But everything is changing on YouTube all the time Everything is changing all the time So there you go, two hours ago I set off the stream But you couldn't see anything, you gotta wait for notifications Which means a lot of people are still waiting around, a lot of people haven't got to this part of town Cause YouTube is changing all the time So here I am, flip the switch and I am a live man I'm a live man Alright, so we're up to 36 viewers like I was saying in the song We've got some issues We've got some, some, some issues <laughs> Kath Lydia says, nice, you sound good, bye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> um, it, it, there's some issues here. The, the way the live streaming has been set up, I can't just, I, for some reason, I can't schedule a live stream ahead of time. There's something, they, they change things all the time. And if you go ahead and you Google, how do I get a YouTube to schedule ahead of time? Well, you, you can't find it. It's just It's just one of those things that's changed. So what I tried to do was make sure that, you know, I could I could set it ahead and I, I must have gone through the settings half a dozen times, couldn't pull it off. So what what I figure I do is just <clears throat> give everybody a few minutes to show up because some of you are just seeing it through the notifications and I have a really a, a good topic tonight and um, I don't want anybody to miss it. So because we have this topic coming up, and because there are people that are still coming in, you know, bit by bit, I'm going to play the song that I wrote 10 minutes ago. Note that this guitar is not my tailor. I sold my tailor. Very sad. But I have this old antique one, so this is going to have to serve us. I'm okay with Ready, here we go. This song is called Just a Guy with a Guitar in His Hand. And we're just we're just playing this song until we get everybody here and then we're gonna talk on the topic because it's really good. We got the dirt on the topic and it's such a good topic. You're not gonna believe this topic. It's an amazing topic. Oh yeah. It's not part of the song. It's just me goofing off. I'm just a guy with a guitar in his hand Without enough commitment to join a band I'm sleeping on a borrowed sofa Not really sure where I'll go from
just a guy with a guitar in his hand Sitting drunk in his best friend's car again All I really need is a little push Or maybe just another can of push Give it So eat your burrito and go to sleep, man. With a guitar in his hand Gonna write the best song And upload it, man I'm just a guy with a guitar in his hand I'm just a guy with a guitar in his hand Okay, actual content starts here. Like I said at the very beginning, we had some little bitty issues with YouTube setting this thing up ahead of time, and I wanted to make sure that people were actually here before we got into the topic. So thank you very much for the Super Chats. <clears throat> um, ben says you should go live on Facebook too. YouTube is, is, is not good. <laughs> ben... Facebook is worse. I had to leave Facebook. Facebook is a cesspool of stupid. I, I cannot handle it. I cannot handle Facebook. I, Facebook is, is dead to me. YouTube I can handle. But. <clears throat> ben, thank you. Ben, you're an amazing artist, man. I, I appreciate it. I... I um, it's one of those things. Um, it's it's uh, it's nature, not nurture. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Karen. Karen sends a twenty dollar super chat. Thanks for being you, and it's a pair with like a little maraca pair. It's what's going on there. It's a pair with a maraca. That's Karen. Thank you. I'm glad to be me. <laughs> um. So. Yeah, I need a mod for Facebook. You really, I really would. The problem with Facebook was just having to scroll through. Not realizing that so many people I knew and grew up with were so stupid. It's it's an over, it, it's too much information is really what it is. Uh, I have been reading a very good book. If you don't own this book, I highly recommend it. Um, and I, I read The Black Swan. I read Skin in the Game. But this is Nicholas... Nassim Taleb's Anti-Fragile. It's very good. And one of the things he said is actually having too much information, too much contact makes you less able to make decent decisions. Uh, more paralyzed and, and not able to bust through. And he uses a lot of different examples for this. But, but basically... In some ways, you are better off throwing darts at a board and betting on the stocks that they hit 
then you are doing all of your research and trying to do the right thing and get the information because everybody else has the same information. So you pick a random cryptocurrency, right? Like Link. Link today went up something like it's like 30% or something like that when I saw it earlier. So so you're like, whoa, Link went up 30%. Well, you, you didn't know that ahead of time and you could have studied and said this could go up or no or whatever. So all you have right now is the information that it went up 30%. It could go down 60% tomorrow. It could go up 100% tomorrow. You don't really know. But if you had had a basket of currencies and you had thrown darts at it, there's not a bad chance that you might have ended up with something that would have taken off. You could have caught some good luck. It's quite interesting. Um, and, and also, the stress levels of having to interact with a whole bunch of people uh, on, on Facebook will also chew you up. So, so if you skip the news and you skip Facebook, obviously don't skip my YouTube videos. But everything else, uh, you, you can often make better decisions Sometimes, uh, you know, just, just flipping a coin and taking the decision based on that is better than paralysis of analysis. So I, I highly recommend it. It's very good. Um, uh, Anti-Fragile by Nazim Taleb. Nazim Taleb. Yeah, uh, Leaf says, Tropical Fruit Forum and Permi seems like good places to hang out. I agree. I am also on Social Galactic. <laughs> Anand says, I have the Dalai Lama song pop into my head from time to time. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so um, let us, let us, I, I think I'm still running on my low resolution. I am not at home and um, I, I am going to just go ahead and I don't know if I can up the resolution on this so it's better. I may be able to. Let me see. I think I can. Let me change it. Let me see if that looks better to you guys. And if it starts choking, well, there we go. Well, have a good night, Karen. Listen, I just had my my dinner, I understand. Okay, so now actual content starts here. <clears throat> uh, what we are going to talk about tonight is bringing dead soil to life and having grown up in South Florida where the soil is basically this dusty sand it's it's sand if you dig down deeper you get white sand and you get interesting like occasional layers of different colored sands like sometimes you get yellow sand sometimes you get kind of a gray blue sand when I was a kid I had great fun digging huge pits into the yard and seeing, you know, we would call it sand mining. And we would take the different colors of sand and we would mix them up, you know. And, and sometimes later when we discovered, you know, the sand art where you pour the art into the jars, we had different colored sand naturally. But the top layer is kind of like beach sand but with some, some dust in it. And, and that's kind of the organic matter that you get. But it's the kind of stuff that will make your hands all, all kind of gray and dirty. If you dig deeper, you get this almost pure white sand like you would buy from a construction company, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the relative mineral contents of the various sand were, but down in South Florida, you wouldn't you wouldn't hit a clay layer. Sometimes you would hit a, a layer of, of um, like rock and shell material, old, old limestone and fossils. And further, as you, as you go further south into the state, you hit that. Now, as you go further north into the state, sometimes you get clay soils, sometimes you get muck soils in some places. And then as you get up into Georgia, you start to get into kind of a mix of clay and sand, which can could sometimes almost be like like rock hard. My my sister Rachel has a property in Georgia, in the southwestern part of Georgia. And in their house, the yard is so hard, it's like this gritty yellow clay sand mix, and it is bad you have to i had to i had to actually buy a pickaxe to help them dig a garden hammer the ground out make like a little three foot by eight foot bed it was brutal work and as you get up into appalachia sometimes you get that real thick pottery clay which has that deep deep like 
red color to it and it's so slick like when we were when we were kids and we went on vacation in um in in Appalachia in North Carolina the mountains there north of Asheville the the clay that we could dig some of it was was clay that had some organic matter in it that you know it was very alive stuff there were a lot of mushrooms in it there was a lot of tree diversity but some of the clay that we would dig was really really like pottery clay and in fact there's a whole pottery kind of industry in that area there are a lot of potters it's it's a very high arts and crafts kind of an area to begin with in the mountains there's the penland school of arts and crafts and there's there's a lot of you know there are old orchards that date back to the 1700s even and and this clay uh, that's that's some tough stuff. I wouldn't say that it's dead soil, but it's not easy soil. It, it tends to get very waterlogged. You can you can you know make an indentation in the ground and pour water into it and have a pond. You know, <clears throat> so depending on where you are, dead soil may may mean different things to you. The soil is not biologically dead almost anywhere except in really heavily worked farmlands or perhaps salt flats or, or, or places like that, you know, a complete biologically dead, completely inert soil is really a rare thing. Usually there's life in it. And those of you in Florida, I see nematodes. Yes, root knot nematodes. There's plenty of life in the soil. And a lot of that life wants to get out of the soil into the roots of your plants and eat them, you know. So the soil... Bringing dead soil to life may be a little bit of hyperbole because the soil itself already has some life in it. What you really want to do is foster and increase the life in the soil and add, add more diversity to it and, and more mineralization. And there's two, there's kind of two schools on this. Modern farming, in many cases, looks, as the, looks at the soil as just a substrate to hold roots. So the soil is where the roots grow and it holds the plants in and you want to make sure that it's well draining, that it's, it's broken up enough, you know, that it's not too acid or too pH, uh, too high, too high pH, too base, you know, and you want to make sure that the soil is, is, is functional. Um, but it's, it's not really looking at how alive the soil is. What, they, what they'll do is they'll analyze it and they'll say, well, is there enough zinc in it? Or is it how short on nitrogen is it? How short on this? Or is it too high pH, too low pH? And it's all, it's all kind of a chemical balancing of the soil without necessarily looking at the various bacterial interactions that are going on. But as we come to know more and more about plants and about fungi and about the real life in the soil and, and the role of worms and decomposers and, you know, there, there's so much life in the soil that it, it, there's, there's almost more going on below the soil than there is above the soil. I would say actually there definitely is more going on. And, and the, the biological activity in the soil isn't just a matter of worms maybe making nice holes in the ground so your plant's roots have good drainage and they can move around easier or, or even manuring the ground by, by digesting bacteria and and chewing up, you know, the grit and, and making nice worm castings that increase, that's part of it. But it goes way deeper than that because there's a huge amount of bacterial and fungal interaction going on with the roots of plants as well. In healthy soil, the bacteria and the fungi and the life in the soil are actually taking the mineral compounds and making them available to the plants. So the more living your soil is, the more it becomes available to the plants, at least in theory. So if you're, if you're farming in dead soil, meaning regularly tilled, not paying any attention to the life in the soil, you're turning it over again and again and again, and, and all you're doing is just saying, okay, how much zinc do we need? How much molybendium? <laughs> do we need some manganese? You know, generally, they're pretty much looking at NPK and a few miners for most, for most crops. They may add a little sulfur. They may add a little magnesium. You know, depending on what the soil is, depending on how frangible it is, you know, um, Friable, frangible. Um, I think I'm too much, too much trading gold, man. 
Um, the the farmer is not really paying attention to a lot of what's beneath the soil. He just wants to make sure that the plants stick their roots in and they have enough of the the minerals that they need to produce a sellable crop. And you can go to the and you can say, okay, well, it's working. They're making food. They're producing Cheetos. Where would we be without Cheetos? I'll tell you where we'd be. We'd be in caves or mud huts. No Cheetos. We need farmers for Cheetos. But what they're doing is obviously working, right? I mean, we could see all these side bad effects like runoff of chemicals. Um, you can see the, you know, the eutrophication of streams and waterways. You could see silt depositing down the Mississippi River. You can see the dust going away into the air off into who knows where every time it gets tilled. But they are producing a lot of food. You know, the, the, the Green Revolution really produced a lot of food. And if you immediately said, well, we're not going to do any more chemical farming, the people would starve to death because the system has become what it is, you know. So the dead soil system is really, that that's the system that is feeding most of us right now, even if you were like, well, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm i a vegan. It's like, well, yeah, but where do you get all that soybean oil that you're, you know, tofu, right? A, a lot, it's, if you were going to be a, a, a vegan and eat only out of your own yard, that that's, that's something. But... You know, most of the vegans or vegetarians that I've known, they, they just buy tons of grains and stuff. They'll eat bread, they'll eat like dried, dried such and such crisp and fake tofu bacon or whatever, you know. Um, that's, that's all coming from, a lot of it is coming from a system of not really paying that much attention to the biology of the soil. So sometimes you go over and say, well, I'm going to buy the organic thing. Well, the organic thing too, the organic... A lot of the organic practices are basically taking the commercial practices, chemical practices, and saying, what would be the organic equivalent that we can use here for weed killing or for pesticide? You know, can we, we could spray with neem instead of malathion. Uh, that would be good. You know, so it's, it's maybe marginally better, but a lot of times they're still buying in, they'll buy in the organic version of a fertilizer and dump it into the soil uh, instead of the chemical version, and and really, sometimes even the organic uh, amendments are worse than the chemical amendments because of the contamination of the entire process by you know long term herbicides and pesticides and heavy metals and stuff. Some things that you know you'd say, well, it was produced organically, but it had biosolids in it or something crazy, you know, and and so maybe there's much higher arsenic levels. <sighs> You're not going to usually get arsenic in your 10-10-10, but you might get arsenic in a load of chicken manure because the chicken feed at points has had arsenic added to it to make the chickens hungrier, and it's just, it's like crazy craziness, right? So, so you look at the whole system, and it's really complicated. Fortunately, most of us don't really have to deal with that in our backyards as much. If we are going to be good stewards of the ground that we have, we don't have to embrace modern chemical farming. We don't have to embrace, you know, whatever all the organic conventions are. We can pick and choose what we want to grow and how we want to grow it and how much life we are going to put into the soil compared to what kind of yields we're going to take out. So if you wanted to get the highest yield possible, You know, you can read these stories about, oh, I did it all organic, and I had the most incredible this and the incredible that. That takes time, usually. Or it takes you going out and buying various amendments. You go buy blood meal and bone meal and fish emulsion and, and you know, super organic, whack-a-mole, you know, whatever. Whatever stuff, you know, magical organic amendments are going to make things grow huge. Or you can, or you could pour some some chemical fertilizer in there. I mean, miracle Grow works great. Wow, yeah, man, look at those tomatoes. Um, 
So you, you can figure out what you want to do with that <clears throat> and how you want to balance care for the soil and your actual yields. Because if you were at the beginning of Corona Chan, at the beginning of Corona Chan, let me see. One second. Uh, I think right here. Here we go. When when Corona Chan showed up, if you hadn't been building your soil to begin with, and and, and suddenly everybody's getting locked down, and things are falling to bits. If you didn't put in the effort on your soil long term to begin with, are you going to be like, okay, this year, man, I'm going to make sure that I foster all the worm growth and the fungi growth that I never did before, you know? I love all the bugs in soil. I Never ever going to spoil, never let air down into the ground with a fork. I won't break your mycelial tendrils. You know, you're gonna be all like hippie about it, and you weren't ready, and you're like, oh, you know, what are you gonna do? You need to build the soil ahead of time. Cause it's not like the sort of thing that happens overnight. You till up a bit of lawn. Um, like here, look at this, okay? Um, first of all, you have Crayon says, how do you convince people to accept natural growing methods? How do you help grow soil biology fast? Here's one of the two questions that led to tonight's good stream. Corona Chan. Corona Chan came here fast. Building soil biology fast, that's a different thing. And then Drew writes, ways to quickly bring life to dead dirt, such as when you convert a lawn to a garden, reduce compaction, increase carbon, etc. A lot of these things take a little bit of time. You know, it took about a year of deep mulching before I really saw that awesome, that awesome, fungally dominated, rich, mushroomy soil in my old food forest. It takes some time to rot down. At first, those those chips actually are sucking the nitrogen out of the ground, you know? Uh, it, it's not easy. It, it's, not, it's not like the overnight process. Sometimes people try to make it the overnight process. Hey, I'm gonna go buy a huge load of compost. But you guys remember what happened when Caroline Ham, we did a live stream on her a few months ago. Caroline bought this huge load of compost put it all in these beds, and then guess what? It was contaminated with amino pyrrolids and it ended up killing everything off. She would have been better off buying 10, 10, 10. Go and buy some 10, 10, 10. That's not gonna twist your tomato leaves up. It's not gonna destroy everything for the next year or two because it's supposedly organic amendment is contaminated with something nasty. So fast is, is, is tough. But everybody wants fast. Ways to quickly bring life to dead dirt, such as when you convert a lawn to a garden, reduce compaction, increase carbon, etc. Quickly. How do you convince people to accept natural growing methods? How do you keep, how do you help? Um, it, it's, it's kind of a continuum. If you have been working on the soil for a few years, it gets really, really, really good. Josie says, leaf mold is my best friend at the moment. Yeah, leaf mold is fantastic. <laughs> Rick says, can we talk about olives now? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> well, love cat, enjoy your tacos. That's awesome. Tacos have arrived now. So we've got a little bit of a lag here. So I am going to um, drop the settings down a little bit because there's more I want to talk about. I'm going to drop this down to 600. Let's see how that does. Maybe that'll help a little bit. So, if we are looking at not 
doing the chemical farming thing, we got to think long term. So if you have clay, what you're going to try and do is add organic matter to increase the drainage. You may fork it up the first time. I, I, I always, I, I, unless I'm dealing with some perennials or I have some really hard, hard ground, I, I, I always will fork the ground up the first time, plant my crops, you know, and then deep mulch over it or continually mulch it or whatever if I'm going to do a, a no-till thing. I don't no-till like completely because um, that takes like a year often to really loosen the soil very well. Unless you want to do it with a lasagna garden, you have a whole ton of organic matter you could trust and then you want to, you know, dig into it, put a little finished compost in little baskets basically inside of you, dig the little holes and you put a little finished compost in you plant and then over time it rots down. You could do that too. But usually if we're talking survival gardening or feeding yourself, um, you know, with this lovely lady around, you, you're, um, you're, you're just, it's just too much work. I mean, you need food, right? So you're, what you're going to do is lean towards the dead soil side of the equation. How do you feed that dead soil? Forget the soil life, Right. When you need potatoes, sweet potatoes, like in, in a few months because you're nervous, you're not like, oh my goodness, I hope I didn't disturb any bacteria. I would not be able to eat these potatoes if a single bacteria died. No, look it, man. A little bug has come and wrecked the whole world. You can wreck a few bugs. It's only just. It's revenge. Yes. I am a multicellular supremacist. It's right there, spelled out. It's right there in turned earth. So, what do you do? It's called extractive farming. <laughs> what you're doing is you are extracting more than you're putting in. You're not building a system long term. This is not the way I garden normally, but this may be the way you do it in a crisis. You dig your beds, you find whatever you could fertilize with, you keep the stuff alive, you make calories, you keep yourself alive, and and, and you, you pull out from the bank of the ground, you're pulling out of it. This is not ideal. This is not what I want to do long term. But in the case of, okay, how do I do it fast? You can, you can increase the biology pretty rapidly. But you can't make an awesome ecosystem like fast, fast, fast. Your first garden on the ground may not be fast. You know, you can foster the life, but the life has to grow and breed. You know, you figure it takes a few months for the worm population to, to expand, to double, triple, or whatever. When you put the organic matter down right away, it's not like the earthworms are just like the next day you've got earthworms everywhere. It takes time for it to build. If you've ever raised a, a worm bin, done vermicomposting, I've done it multiple times, it takes time for the system to really start to fill up full of worms. You buy this little bag of worms, one pound of red wigglers, you know, and or whatever, and 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 you put them in there. It's not like immediately, man, it's it's working. No, you, you better not put much watermelon in there. You better not put too many peelings in there because it's going to get a rot on the surface until that worm population really starts to breed and grow and everything starts to become alive and they chew down all of the shredded paper or cardboard or whatever you put in there and they've, they've kind of got an ecosystem going and then you have lots of worms and then it gets to a point where you can throw stuff in there and then overnight it's, it's, it's all chewed up and gone and turned into castings. That's when you know your worms have made it. That's really cool. But at the beginning... You know, you're probably going to be pulling out more from the garden than you than you're putting into it, unless you have access to a ton of compost or that sort of thing, which which takes time. You know, it's it's the key to really making the soil alive is first of all not to poison it and to cover it, but the, but the key is is really the organic matter. If you get enough organic matter in the ground. Uh, like like good organic matter, stable long-term humus, that really just facilitates a lot of interactions in the soil. That organic matter is really important to your plants. Now the other thing that you do, and, and it ties into this, I can't even say it's one key, it's, it's like a key with multiple teeth really, 
is, is having a lot of plant life on top of the ground. If you have enough plant life cooking along, the roots that are going down into the ground are exuding sugars that are captured from the sun, captured and generated from sunlight. Plant makes sugars. Plant exudes sugars into the ground, attracting various life, fungal and bacterial, creating this huge burgeoning ecosystem. First, it creates the little single-celled stuff. The single-celled stuff start breeding and growing around the plant roots. There's this whole like incredible circle of life that's happening around the root system of every plant. And we don't see it. We just pull it out and we say, oh, there's a few roots there. No, it goes down way to the microscopic level. level tiny little threads. Each root is growing and stopping and growing and stopping and moving around with little adventitious buds going here and there in the soil and then exuding sugars and other compounds that are bringing in soil life, which in turn brings other soil life to eat that soil life. There's this huge massive ecosystem that's going on because the plants above the ground are feeding the soil beneath. So if you cut all the plants down and you just leave the soil dead, the soil life dies. It just, it's, it's done. It, it, you know, there, there's some that will live there fighting and growing and breeding, etc. But the plants have a huge amount to do it. So if you really want to do yourself a favor on a new piece of ground, if you don't have, if you don't have a bunch of mulch to drop, plant a bunch of cover crop stuff. Throw buckwheat out there and mustard out there and lentils and chickpeas. Go to the bulk bins at Whole Foods and pick up a bunch of that weird stuff that I guess rabbits eat it, you know, all those seeds, all those grains and beans and peas, uh, you know, get get like a little bit of each one of them and, and make a big thing of them, you know, peanuts, whatever. Just make sure it's all the raw stuff. And then you take that and you just scatter that over the ground and then it all grows quickly. You know, throw a little bit of grass clippings or something over, or just kind of rake it in. Keep it watered for a few weeks if it's not raining out. And then all that stuff starts to grow. You get all this crazy, crazy life. And then the soil life beneath really, really starts to grow, starts to go insane. So then you can chop that stuff and drop that stuff or, or chop it and plant into it or till it under and plant more stuff. But, but what happens is that soil life uh, grows exponentially when you put a green manure slash cover crop on top of it. So it's one of the best things you can do is just take a whole bunch of stuff. It doesn't matter if you go and get a flower, you know, wildflower mix. That's cool. It brings in a bunch of other life. Throw your old seed packets in there. Maybe you get a little stuff you can harvest. Oh, there's, like, there's a lettuce over there. There's a turnip over there. I, I take all my old seed packets and mix it with a bunch of other stuff and just use it for cover crop mixes. I've got a big area. I want it to be alive for the next garden. Just throw those seeds around, man. It's awesome. I'm going to have to do this uh, with my fall gardens just to show you guys because it's so stinking cool. You get so much life there. And you mix in various things that you can eat along with grains that you don't really care about. Like I don't care to harvest rye, but rye makes a massive root system. A massive root system. So what it's doing is it's putting exudates in the ground, breeding up the bacteria, bringing those fungi in, and at the same time it's adding a ton of organic matter to the ground underneath the surface. All those little threads of roots, big massive threads of roots, all there, organic matter in the ground. So if you want to make the soil alive, plant stuff on it. But sometimes Sometimes the soil is in such lousy condition and sick that you have to do some work on it first before you get there. Before you get to the point where you're like, I eat, where a cover crop even wants to stick. If you're in that situation, there's some other things that you've got to do. So um, the mineral content of the soil, the geology of the soil is very important you will either be working with it or you will be fighting it. In South Florida, you are fighting geology all the time because you've got sand. Sand. 
you don't have any clay for the cation exchange to take place or to hold on to and create stable humic acid molecules. So without having any clay there, when you throw organic matter on the ground in South Florida, it just it's gone. I mean, it's literally eaten by the soil and the soil life in a very, very short period of time. It doesn't stick. It just goes back to looking like sand dunes uh, with weeds on it unless you're constantly feeding it or keeping lots of plant life on the surface or mulching it regularly. And some people now, I, I'm getting a lot more of these kind of comments in the last few years, people that'll say, everything plants need is accessible in any soil so long as there's the right soil life. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. There's the Elaine Ingram end of the spectrum where basically any soil could be good soil. And there's the Steve Solomon end of the spectrum, uh, which is your soil can be much better, but what you need to do is pay attention to the mineralization of the soil. As Steve writes in his book, The Intelligent Gardener, which I, I greatly enjoy, and I talk to Steve all the time. Um, Steve, Steve writes in The Intelligent Gardener about how he was a very strong advocate of composting and organic gardening. And he grew his own produce, huge amounts of produce. And he lived on his own produce, by golly. I mean, he really, he said it was, it was pretty much all of his diet was compost created on his own land. His own, he grew his own food and he ate that. And he got issues with his teeth and his joints. And he just he just did not put two and two together until he and his wife went on a trip and they were in a, they were on a volcanic island for a period of time. I think it was Fiji. And he said they were just eating produce. They ate a lot of produce. They were eating produce there. And he said in 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 a, in a couple of weeks, his teeth tightened tightened up and they weren't as loose. And he felt much better, and some issues that he had been having just cleared up. And he was like, he, he couldn't figure out, like, why do I feel so much better here? And he started, he, the thought came to him, maybe it's the soil. Because he'd been eating all his own stuff. And he says, David, I was eating commercially grown produce with who knows what chemicals. And my health greatly improved. Because of the soil, he told me. He told me we were talking about the, you know, the story, and he, he's like, "I got better because of the minerals in the soil, volcanic minerals." So if anyone would have been able to take poor thin soil, he, I mean, a lot, a lot of the permaculture folks will say, "Look, take the worst soil you can get and improve it, and, and put lots of organic matter in it, make it really alive, stack, stack lots and lots of mulch on top of it to build that." build that soil up with huge amounts of organic matter, take the worst soil possible and make it beautiful again. You're, you're restoring the environment. And I think that that's a noble cause. But you also have to realize that I, I in my opinion, which is decidedly non-scientific, but informed, <laughs> if you're missing underlying elements in the soil, you're not going to get them through the work of bacteria or fungi or something else. They're, they're not going to deliver sulfur that isn't there or molybdenum that isn't there or cobalt that isn't there, et cetera, so on and so forth. So you want the very best soil life possible for the very best exchange of minerals available. But at the same time, you do have to delve over possibly into that dead soil chemical farming realm and say, what is missing here? What would be the last bit that would make these plants grow really well? But you go beyond that. You know, they'll take an, a mineral analysis of the soil and they're only looking for like five or six things. But somebody like Steve, he goes and he gets he 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 gets lab tests on all of his soil now. And he wants lab tests that tell him, you know, how's the silicon? How's how's the you know the molybdenum? What are the iron levels like? What are the copper levels like? 
And, and then you get to the very edge of all the minerals that your body needs, and all the minerals that your plants could use to reach the maximum level of nutrition and, and health possible. By, by making sure, by adding them, you may add them as dead elements. You may dust elemental sulfur on there. You may buy a manganese fertilizer or use Epsom salts. I don't believe there's anything wrong with that. The elements exist all over the planet. They're in the rocks. They're in the earth. We're made up of elements. There's nothing wrong with getting them from a, you know, a laboratory because elements are elements. It's, it's like I can get nitrogen from, you know, in a, in a, in a nitrogen fertilizer in a solution, or I could get nitrogen in chicken manure. I would rather use the chicken manure because of all the additional micro elements that are going to be in there that it's that it's also got um, it's going to add some more humus to the soil and, and these kind of things but if it is a pinch and I'm missing nitrogen I'll throw it on there if I don't salt the soil with a bad form of it and murder the soil life if I can if I can buffer it to an extent and and mix it into the compost or mix it into the soil a little bit i, I don't really care if the soil life is good um elements are elements you want the maximum level of soil life possible but 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 elements are are elements not really all that concerned so you know steve solomon went the gamut he's generally a an organic farmer and he really believes in taking care of the soil and growing growing the best crops possible, but he's very much interested in getting high production, but at the same time, making that production have the highest mineral levels possible for the good minerals that your body needs. So Steve is still out there digging in his late 70s, and and his, and he's still sharp and, and, and like on top of things. And I think it's in large part because he's paid attention to, to the soil life. So dead soil, in my, the way I would classify it, dead soil would be soil that is both lacking on the mineral side and lacking on the biological side. So something like beach sand, you know, some, some plants are going to do okay in it, but a lot of them are not. But you could take that beach sand and take it and, and do an analysis of it. And say, oh, well, this beach sand is short in this, and it's high in this, and it's short in this. And you can balance that, and at the same time, put in a lot of organic matter, get all that fungal activity going, get some leaf mold, get, get you know, when you cut your grass, stack it up and let it rot down. Every time there's food coming through your house, you know, like stuff that you didn't, you didn't uh, grow on your own land, coming in from different places, like if you're buying... Uh, bell peppers and the bell peppers are coming in from Mexico you know and you eat steak and the steak is coming from the glacial soils of Wisconsin um, the scraps are going to be high in all kinds of minerals that are probably not in your own area so uh, the the compost pile in that case becomes a a way for a lot of these minerals to work their way into your garden if you have a closed loop system where it's all in your own land, all you're going to do is keep cycling the, nu the nutrients on your land. So if you have a lack of molybendium and you're just chopping everything and recycling it back through the compost pile, throw it over the garden beds, harvest the garden beds, throw the scraps back in the compost pile, back in the garden beds, you're not going to have enough molybendium. You're going to have a problem. So I'm hoping to get some, some soil tests for uh, you know my soil in the future. It's a little difficult here obviously um things are things just don't run that way very well you can get a ph test but that's about it uh but but a proper mineral analysis is really useful and if you can't get a proper mineral analysis what what you do like what i've been doing is kind of just overshoot the mark throw a bunch of seaweed out there you know bring in stuff from out put a bunch of seaweed in there put some leaf mold in there take some you know um whatever I, I took sand from the beach some of that black sand because it was like that looks like it has lots of minerals in it i'll throw some of that in my gardens um there was this huge pile of crushed sea urchin shells i took this huge pile of crushed sea urchin shells and i just spread it over the gardens 
I took ashes from tall jungle trees and I spread them with the gardens. So what I'm trying to do is balance and bring in a wide range of micronutrients so the plants have a smorgasbord to choose from without exactly knowing which thing I'm low in. I'm low in I have a pretty good idea that that the biology is going to sort out what those plants need and get it to them. So that's my decidedly non-scientific approach to mineralizing the soil is to just get stuff from all over the place and throw it into the system. So it feeds it. Which, which you know, if you're going to be doing composting, uh, y you know, you can, you can make your compost in big piles with everything that's going through the house. And it's really nice to have that beautiful, perfect, sifted compost that you can put right into, you know, plant trays or in your garden beds and you have that really nice finished stuff, but you really don't need to do that either. I've just took trenches in the garden and thrown all the scraps out there, the bones, the meat, the old stew, rotten potatoes, whatever, doesn't matter, throw it, throw it in there. I have the kids, every time they eat fruit, they just go throw the, throw the peels around the garden beds, throw them around the base of a fruit tree. What I don't like is if anything gets thrown in the trash that could be recycled back into the ground because that's, that's minerals that are not making it back into the loop. So I watched one of the kids eat a banana and then throw the peel across. Don't throw it into the neighbor's yard. <laughs> throw it into our yard. So the potassium, the calcium, or whatever's in that peel goes right back into the ground. Um, so first of all, what you want to do is get a yield. Second of all, build that soil life like crazy. Um, compost teas are a good way to do it. Green manures are a good way to do it, and and obviously adding the organic matter and getting that soil life going that way is good. Leaf mold is good, as you said, and um, uh, Brian says, doesn't mycorrhiza get nutrients from a mile away? Yeah, mycorrhiza are fantastic. If the ground is not all torn up and the mycorrhiza have fungal networks, I don't know about a mile away, but it's it's. Um, the reach is the reach is definitely increased on the plant roots because they do attach to the plant roots and work with them. So, let me see here. I am going to go through and see what we have for uh, super chats here and answer any questions. I'm just going to tie that up with green manure. Put down organic matter. Get a soil test if you can. Try to get life into the soil. Through, through good organic means. Try to build your soil long term with regular repeated mulching and adding you know, seaweed and ashes and all these kinds of things. But if you're worried right now and you're like, I need food, don't try to be a purist, just, just get food, right? I, 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 I want you to be freed from the guilt of being like, I'm destroying the soil. Look, you can fix it. Nature fixes itself really well. I would much rather have you have a, a <laughs> You know, a wheelbarrow full of non-organic potatoes than than a handful of potatoes because you didn't do the proper no-till thing or, or whatever. You know, so. Um, so Ben sent a super chat saying that's why you need a mod in Facebook, take up interaction for you, and get more conversions to your YouTube. Let's see. That's why you need a mod in Facebook. for you and you'll get more conversions <laughs> for your YouTube maybe but I mean is it just me or is Mark Zuckerberg actually a lizard I mean I don't think it's just me Let me see what we got here. Betty. Betty sends five, six, seven. Betty says. <laughs> I planted pop chop. The label said it was a mustard to keep down nematodes. Will that Glad to see you too, Betty. Glad to see your smiling face, Betty. Yes, 
Here, here's the deal. The, the label said it was mustard to keep down nematodes. There have been studies on nematodes being suppressed by brassicas in, in general. So mustard is well known for suppressing nematodes, but also cabbages, crushed cabbage leaves being tilled into the soil. A lot of, they make these strong uh, sulfur compounds that nematodes don't seem to like. So I, I think that the pak choy would probably deter nematodes as well, except that I have had nematodes eat some of my pak choy. But I also had them eat some of my mustard. So there's more than one variety. There's many, many nematodes in the soil, many of which are actually beneficial. But... <clears throat> Let's see. <laughs> Big winks to the chippets. That is a weird name. Can we feed the world from David's fetid swamp water? It it works really well. Nutrient tea. Giordano Lucas says, I bought a sumo citrus tree and they told me to use imidacloprid. Is it toxic? Uh, with a name like imidacloprid, I, I haven't studied it, but I would say toxic. I, if you can't say it, is it toxic? What would be an effective, safe alternative? I'm not sure what they're telling you to use that for. A mind with heart says, I have high boron levels in my well water. Yeah, that can definitely be a problem. Uh, you may be able to mitigate that by... Um, adding some charcoal to your soil to soak it up. <clears throat> Good morning from the Philippines. Let's see here. Oh, Gloria, that's, that's a very generous super chat. Gloria says, just had chip drop. Let's see. Delivered this week after moving six pine and oak trees from the front yard, running out of room and back. My goal is no grass and all that post 900 square feet near St. Cloud. Some compaction recommendation. legumes um try to get nitrogen fixing trees try to get uh perennial sunflower throw wildflower mixes out there put my goodness just put stuff out there put lots and lots of life on top of that ground huge amounts the more life you can get on top of the sand for that chop and drop it makes a big big difference you know um that is really the life in that sandy soil is on top of it mostly so I would definitely keep that, keep that going. Um, the chip drop is a great thing. 
and and if you if you did remove six pine and oak trees even if those are chopped up into bits and you put them all over the place in like you know just just put the logs laying on their sides here and there out there and work around them they will feed the fungi those are good to have really good and um hopefully i'll get to to help you at some point that would be really cool to see what you're doing the compaction it does make a difference to like fork an area up but i wouldn't bother forking the whole thing if you if you drop chips all over the place um it will it will work so um like it'll take a year or two but it'll start to come back <clears throat> I'm having some issues with the streaming. I don't know if you guys are seeing this. Um, I am on so-so internet tonight, so I'm going to try and drop this more. We'll see if we can. We'll see if we can at least keep it alive. Come on. That should do it. <laughs> My green screen is not working right. Sun hemp and sorghum grass are both good. Yep, plants with fibrous roots that hold the ground together. Yes, that's very good. Yes, double dig, but do not mix mulch into the dirt. That's a good point. Don't, because it will chew it up. Fight the man says, not buying that last story. A guy needs to brush his teeth. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You've got to look up um, soil and health. It's a good book. They actually did studies in World War II, according to who was drafted and, and what level of difficulties people had that kept them out of the service. Um, some people were not fit enough, and and this fellow took um, took an overview of the country according to where the best, the healthiest draftees were coming from, and it actually was it linked and correlated with the mineralization of the soil because at that point a lot of people were eating from their own neighborhoods. It's very interesting. Hey, Haley. Brian says, won't plants get minerals they need from the relationship with mycorrhiza? Yes, they will, but the minerals have to actually exist first. The mycorrhiza can't make them out of the air. Yeah, I wouldn't use sawdust either, Josie. Gloria says, could I grow a cherimoya or soursop? I have seedlings and hope. Probably in a pot. Boy, that's a, that's, it's too cold there. Both of those are quite cold susceptible. Unless you were willing to like build a greenhouse over the top of them. Big Mammal says, I got black walnut. Like weeds, okay to chop and drop. Yes, it is when they're young. The, the jugalone content really starts to build up as they get bigger. So Kurt says, David, thank you for what you do. Streaming is choppy. I am cancer free. Holly is back to work. Praise the Lord for that. We were praying for Kurt. Everybody who don't doesn't know who, who Kurt is. <laughs> Kurt was diagnosed with cancer. And his wife had a heart attack like within a very short period of time. I mean, just... Kurt is a solid, cool dude. I, I, I call and, you know, I talk to him and his wife and we've emailed back and forth for quite a while. He used to, he used to, um, write me back before anybody knew who I was. <laughs> that is, a, that is so great, Kurt. Praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, Mary volunteers to send Gloria some moles from her yard because they're doing great loosening the soil. Michael says, if you use city water for plants, would that cause yellow spots and possibly twisted leaves? No, probably not. Um, the yellow spots are probably something burning it or a uh, check the bottom of the leaves and see if there's anything sucking or chewing or, or, or getting on it. There's various things that cause yellow spots. 
Um, the twisting leaves are not a good sign. The twisting leaves are usually either an infestation of something like, like mites or scale or aphids, or worse, it's a chemical contamination. So, hey, Jeffrey, hello from Malaysia. Hello, Malaysia. One of my friends growing up was from Malaysia. He was Chinese Malaysian. Um, so I, I am somewhat familiar with Malaysia. You've got some amazing, amazing plants there. Holy moly. Hey, Jeremiah, nice to see you. Hello from Nicaragua. Hello, Lupe. Fantastic. Nicaragua. <clears throat> so, the wilds of Oregon. <laughs> so, guys, I am going to let you go. Um, if you if you missed the song at the beginning, well, there were a couple of songs at the beginning. If you missed them, you may want to go back and listen because they were so, so good. No, they really weren't that good. I wrote that song just a little while ago, but... Take good care of Corona Chan, uh, and take good care of your gardens. I um, I am in transition right now, doing a lot of stuff. Some of you guys know what I'm doing. Some of you don't, but um, I'll have some good news soon. Hopefully, I'm just um, busy, busy, busy trying to get rid of some stuff right now. Waiting around. Wendy is just in time for the end. It's like left behind when you find those clothes laying in the hallway and you know you've been left behind. You've been left behind. You've been left behind. You've been left behind. Yeah, that's nice. I used to be a dispensationalist, then I was a Calvinist, and now I'm sort of a, a Lutheran, I think, so. <clears throat> well, I'll catch you guys later. God bless you all. Thank you very much. I want to thank um, those of you who are the members who have supported. Um... No, see, Julia, this is my other guitar. I sold my Taylor. I have this, this antique one that I got from Full Circle music in Oakland, Florida. This has no name on it. It is a, it's strong as a classical. I think it used to be a steel string. And this guitar I kept, I had to sell my tailor. So, mm. ah, there you go. I did not ask questions about raspberries and compost. Um, thank you, Karen. Where is that raspberries and compost? Where is that? Raspberries and compost. See if I can answer it. Lizard man like Bill Gates. Okay. I saw that one. I am looking. I am looking. Um. Oh, okay. I see. Lisa says, would you layer chopped up raspberry bushes, leaves, and wood chips over a garden plot for compost? Yeah, sure. The problem with the raspberries, though, is that they're often really, really thorny, and it's and they're nasty. So if you try to plant through them and you're working around in there pulling carrots and stuff, it could tear you up. Um, but they, they rot down just fine. I would tend to use thorny stuff more in the food forest systems around the base of my fruit trees, so I don't have to stick my hand through it. So um, that's that's good. But thank you, Karen. That was, that was very nice of you. Yes, Rick. <laughs> thank you, guys. Um, God bless you all. I will catch you again. Maybe I'll do a morning stream tomorrow for those of you that are in Europe. I was asked to do that. So if I can think of something and I have a good strong cup of coffee, maybe I'll get up in the morning and uh, and set a stream up. We may not have much notification first because of the little issues I'm having with the new setup on YouTube. But hopefully we also have a higher quality internet because it is really slow tonight and it is jamming the stream up. So... Um, Numenor Bear said, Bear, I will answer this one. Numenor Bear says, can anyone tell me why raw untreated sawdust is bad? The raw untreated sawdust is not bad. Uh, it's just super high in carbon, which means that in order to be digested in the soil, it needs a lot of nitrogen. So if you want it to break down, you basically have to soak it with urine or uh, mix it with manure or something like that and let it rot down for a while. If you were to just stir it into the ground, 
it would suck up the nitrogen and plants would have a very difficult time. And the other thing that it would do is um, sometimes what it what it'll 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 actually like clump up and get wet and you from getting down into the ground. So I, I like compost. I think it's really good for composting or sawdust is compost for composting toilet systems and then bits and bits. Um, the replay will be up soon and I will catch you all next time. Sorry about the jerky video. Have a great night. And thanks to all the super chatters. And until next time, may your thumbs always be green.